This week on Vaticano, visit the birth city of the newly proclaimed Dutch saint, Titus Brandsma. Also learn about the new blessed Pauline Jaricot, the foundress of the Pontifical Mission Societies. And discover with us the oldest Marian icon in Rome, the Madonna of San Sisto, also known as the Advocata. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. Pope Francis on Sunday, May the 15th, recognized 10 new saints of the Catholic Church during a canonization mass attended by an estimated 45,000 people in St. Peter's Square. They were the church's first canonizations since the COVID-19 pandemic began. Religious men and women, priests, and a layman were among the 10 people now officially recognized as being in heaven after living lives of exemplary holiness on earth. Holiness doesn't consist of a few heroic gestures, but of many small acts of daily love, Pope Francis said during his homily. 15 April 1607, San Paolo VI lo dichiarò beato. The Mass began with the rite of canonization, which included the reading of short biographies of each blessed. Charles de Foucault, Titus Brandsma, Deva Sahayam Pillai, Marie Rivier, Maria Francesca of Jesus, Maria Domenica Mantovani, Maria of Jesus Santo Canale, Cesar de Bus, Luigi Maria Palazzolo, Giustino Maria Russolillo. They discovered an incomparable joy and they became brilliant reflections of the Lord of History. For that is what a saint is, a luminous reflection of the Lord of History. May we strive to do the same. One of the new saints is Charles de Foucault. He was a French soldier and explorer who became a Trappist monk and missionary to Muslims in Algeria. Known as Brother Charles of Jesus, he was killed in 1916. Sunday evening, after the canonization mass, a musical performance depicting the life of Saint Charles de Foucault was performed in Rome. When the sick will come, carry him to bed, and as if the Lord was welcomed, offer him the best the house can give, from the first rule of 1140 of the Order of Malta. From COVID relief to migratory rescue operations in the Mediterranean Sea, and aid in natural disaster recovery, the Italian Relief Corps of the Order of Malta is helping out on the ground. For over 900 years, the Sovereign Order of Malta has been upholding human dignity and caring for people in need. With the Ukraine crisis emerging as the biggest humanitarian crisis on the European continent since World War II, the Italian Relief Corps of the Order of Malta, or CISO as it's known in Italian, believes its message and purpose are as relevant as ever as it provides food, shelter, and medical assistance to the displaced. Thousands of volunteers are working tirelessly. Recently, the First Lady of the United States, Jill Biden, while visiting the Slovak-Ukrainian border, met with a team of volunteers from the Order of Malta who were assisting Ukrainian refugees. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, today you call us to welcome the members of God's family. The Ukrainian crisis 
has been the most dramatic development in, in years. And in fact, it stimulated the Order of Malta to work in a way which is the closest one to the original mission, to receive people displaced by the Russian invasion and to take care of them and to try to help them in settle down in the countries uh, nearby. Today we have more than 16,000 volunteers, medics, paramedics and, and, and people trying to, to help. And uh, a big fundraising operation has been uh, uh, carried forward and I think to know that the result is above 40 million euros, which is quite, quite a lot for our standards. So uh, I think that the order is performing at, really at its best at the moment, which is good because it reinforces the sense of purpose of people working for the order. While the order may have been founded in 1048, its mission is as current as ever. Hello and welcome to this week's Vaticano Updates, the most important news from the Holy Father and the Vatican. The 16th annual exorcism course took place in Rome. Catholic priests and lay people from around 25 countries came to Italy for the event called the Exorcism Minister and the Liberation Prayer. 120 participants from countries such as Colombia and Nigeria learned about this important ministry of the church. Pope Francis invited grandparents and the elderly to join a spiritual and nonviolent revolution. In his message for the Second World Day for grandparents and the elderly, the Pope urged seniors not to despair at their frailty, but to embrace a new mission of caring for others. On May 10th, Pope Francis sent a letter to the head of the Copts, Tawadros II, celebrating the ninth anniversary of Coptic Catholic friendship. Francis said he hopes for a continuation of the common pilgrimage. Cardinal Pietro Perlin showed concerns about Cardinal Joseph Zen's arrest in Hong Kong earlier this month, which might complicate the Holy See's dialogue with China. Zen was arrested on May 11th, but released on bail a few hours later. The controversial agreement between the Vatican and Beijing is up for renewal this fall. In his message for the World Day of Migrants and Refugees, the Pope said history showed that new arrivals played a fundamental role in social and economic growth and have enormous potential to help society if they are given a chance. Pope Francis decried the low birth rate in Western countries, describing it as an urgent social emergency and a form of new poverty. During the meeting, the general state of the birth rate, held in Rome, Francis emphasized the need to give real answers to families and young people. Thank you for watching this week's Vaticano Updates. I'm Hannah Brockhaus for EWTN Vaticano. An hour's drive north of Amsterdam is the region of Friesland, Netherlands. It was in this territory where the newly canonized St. Titus Bransma was born and raised. To better understand his origins and impact, we follow his trail of sanctity by visiting the town of Bolsvart. At the edge of the town of Bolsvart is a dairy farm, still operated today by the Bransma family. This monument just outside the house informs pilgrims and residents out for a stroll that this is the site of Titus's childhood home. Among the village's canals is the Detide Cultural Museum, where on the second floor of what used to be the city hall, the Titus Bransma exhibit holds artifacts from the saint's life. It's 
Inside, we meet Gottfried von Achtoven, an expert on St. Titus. This is the Titus Brandsma room, where we have an exhibition that has been set up especially for putting Titus in the spotlight on the occasion of his canonization. He was born here, baptized, celebrated his first mass, buried his parents and attended all kinds of celebrations. Here lies the baptismal register of St. Martin's Church, where it is written that Titus was born and baptized. He received the names Anno Siod Titus, legitimate son of Titus, and Titia Bosma. So already, then he was called Anno Siod Titus. So with the name, he would also carry as friar. Titus Bransma is for me inspiring. Titus Bransma is an inspiring saint for me because he is a very versatile man and he is a man of depth. He is profound. He had drawn this mainly from his contemplative life, from his life as a Carmelite. At the local St. Francis Parish, which was built while Titus Bransma was a priest, the banner that adorned the facade of St. Peter's Basilica during his beatification in 1985 now has a place. Father Arjen Bulsma shows us a chapel that was added near the entrance of the church where pilgrims are invited to pray. Since he became a blessed, we have a little chapel here in remembrance of him. Of course, there are no real relics of him. I think rather special. We have an, an, uh, an urn, it's called in English, I think, and um, there are some ashes from Dachau. The remembrance of Dachau, he being killed and also cremated there, is for us very important. Father Titus Bransma taught philosophy at Radboud University in the town of Nikmekin. He served a one-year term as rector in 1939 and was also a journalist, writing articles for the local Catholic newspaper. When Nazi Germany invaded and took control of the Netherlands in 1940, his influence and role in the community made him a target of the Third Reich. He wrote a lot in newspapers. He was the one who tried to keep the Catholic newspapers Catholic in this time of war. So he tried to make sure there was no NSB propaganda in this Catholic media. Well, that was also the reason, one of the reasons, the main reasons why he was uh, in prison and at, at the end he was killed. After being transferred from one prisoner work camp to another, St. Titus was martyred at Dachau concentration camp just outside Munich where he was killed in a gas chamber and cremated. He died because of willing to be true to the truth. Also in the sense of the dignity of every human person, Christian, Jewish, doesn't matter. Every human person has his own, her own dignity and that can't, can't be betrayed and he stood for this. St. Titus Bransma from Bolsvard held the world's attention on Sunday with his canonization banner displayed over the main door of St. Peter's Basilica, as he and nine other blesseds were declared saints by Pope Francis. This moment for the church is a pivotal one, as more heroes of faith and truth, like St. Titus, are recognized in heaven for future generations to seek out.
There are more than one billion Catholics in the world today. A young French woman played a crucial role in the extensive growth of the church over the last two centuries. She played such a significant role, in fact, that it's really quite surprising how little known Pauline Jaricot is. Two hundred years ago, in 1822, she created an initiative that soon became pontifical and thus internationally recognized as an official part of the Universal Church. The Pontifical Mission Societies became the engine for the evangelization of the peoples of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and are still operating worldwide today. The current president of the Pontifical Mission Societies, Archbishop Gian Pietro Daltoso, admires Pauline Jarico for her perseverance, and also for the fact that even then, she was far ahead of her time. It was always very impressive for me to see, for example, how very quickly after its founding this work spread to other countries. Germany, as early as 1834, example in Aachen, what we know as Missio Aachen, or in Munich in 1838, what is known as Missio München. But at first, Jaricot's life seemed to confirm some of today's influencer clichés. She was born in Lyon, France, on July the 22nd, 1799, the daughter of a wealthy family of silk manufacturers. Contemporaries described her as pretty and worldly, but also spoiled, vain, and arrogant. She went a little astray until at the age of 17, she heard a sermon on vanity that changed her life. She began to give away her fortune to the needy, simple laborers, and the sick. In addition, she built a network to support the missionary efforts of the church around the world. The purpose, if I can say it in one sentence, is to strengthen the structures of the local church. So the idea was, we have big mission countries. We have a great mission to missionize these countries. By mission, we also mean to establish a local church. And the pontifical mission societies have always had the task of establishing, financing, strengthening the structures of the local church. The pontifical mission societies have therefore founded and financed seminaries from the very beginning, so that this very idea is also strengthened. We need priests from the local area, and only then can a church also be called an important local church if it also has priests and religious from its own ranks. However, the founder, Pauline Jaricot herself, had to endure severe defeats during her lifetime. After a healing experience, which she attributed to St. Philomena, she collected money to build a model factory where workers would have better conditions. But Jaricot was cheated by the administrators and went bankrupt. Completely impoverished and discredited, she died on January the 9th, 1862 but her life's work developed into a precious instrument of evangelization. The charism of Pauline Jaricot is, if I had to say it in one sentence, I could of course say quite a lot, that we all, as baptized Christians, have a responsibility for evangelization, and that we all participate in this evangelization, very concretely through prayer, through sacrifice, also through giving. But the idea is, all of us can, all of us as baptized people, can participate in this missionary work. For Archbishop Daltoso, the beatification on May the 22nd is also a confirmation of Pauline Jaricot's charism and the importance of the work of the mission societies. For the generation of digital natives, on the other hand, her life can also be a model. Jaricot's experience shows that conversions happen and even, and perhaps especially, self-referential influencers can turn things around and become an extraordinary force for good. Rome holds the oldest known depictions of the Virgin Mary. 
In the catacombs of Priscilla, this fresco undoubtedly dates to the 3rd century AD. However, there's a strong Christian tradition that St. Helen, mother of Emperor Constantine, brought to Rome from the east an icon of Mary, made by St. Luke the Evangelist. That image, were that image to still be around, it's debated whether or not it's still in existence, but that image uh, is, uh, is, is in its own right considered Archaeopita because of the, 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 the actual presence of Mary and the child and the role of the evangelist who was already inspired by God to produce the, to produce the image. Archaeopita means not made by human hands. And so the idea is that this is something that's more than just a human representation or a painting. When we talk about this, we're talking about something that is beyond, um, beyond it, it becomes something that's more than just the cleverness of an artist. This is not the interpretation. What we're looking for is as an art that is beyond the interpretation of just an artist. It's in looking for, it's an art or an image that looks for an absolute. There are a few icons in Rome that could be candidates to have been created by St. Luke. Among them, the Salus Populi Romani in the Basilica of St. Mary Major, the Madonna del Conforto in the Basilica of Santa Francesca Romana, the Madonna del Popolo, in the Church of Santa Maria del Popolo, the Madonna delle Grazie in the Church of Santa Maria delle Grazie at the Roman Forum, and several images of the Madonna di San Sisto, known as the Advocata, and kept in Santa Maria in Vialata, Santa Maria del Rosario in Monte Mario, and in the Church of Santa Maria in Araceli. Of the images drawn from the type made by St. Luke in the tradition of the first Madonna and Child. Uh, the most famous one in Rome, I think it would be safe to say, is the Madonna Salus Populi Romani, the uh, Madonna of the salvation of the Roman people, which we have in Santa Maria Maggiore, and of course, was famously taken out on many occasions by Gregory the Great to Pope Francis uh, in moments when Rome and Italy found itself in moments, in, found itself in crisis. The Basilica of St. Mary Major is the oldest church in the West dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary and is a monument of the Council of Ephesus where the church proclaimed Our Lady, Theotokos, Mary, Mother of God. Could the most important Marian basilica in Christendom indicate that the icon of Salus Populi Romani is the first and true image of Our Lady? Paul Bade says no. The icon Salus Populi Romani is from a much, much later date. One can ascertain this by the fact that she has a child in Santa Maria Maggiore. One can easily date this icon by this fact, because at the Council of Ephesus, it was established that Mary is the mother of God, not only the mother of Christ. She is the mother of God, and since that time, she is always depicted with the child. Bade points to another icon which he believes to be the first image of Our Lady. This icon is located in the convent of the Dominican Sisters on top of Monte Mario, for this icon was personally carried by St. Dominic to the community of his first Dominican Sisters in February 1221. Since that time, this icon has been locked up with them behind bars like a prisoner, for Christ's sake. The nuns say, we don't care if she's the oldest. We only know she's the most beautiful icon of all. The artistic technique of this icon dates back to the 1st and 3rd centuries AD. In other words, the technique is clearly pre-Byzantine. It only seems clear that this icon came to Rome in the great iconoclasm. In the iconoclasm, she was rescued from the east and came here to the west. There's a very important quotation from Archimandrite Zenon, who said, In the time of the iconoclasm, and the time of the iconoclastic controversy, the church defended the images. Today, in the time of the great crisis, the images are coming back to defend the church. This is very important. It is very simple. God became man. He did not become a book. And Mary too, she was human. 
and when God became man. He and Mary also became an image. Images are pictorial documents. If the icon of the Advocata at Monte Mario documents the true appearance of Our Lady, why then did she leave a different image of herself to St. Juan Diego in Mexico? And how is it that she has continued to appear with different physical features to visionaries in different parts of the world? Watch the next Vaticano to discover the answers.